My guest this week is counted amongst the greatest of British sporting heroes. Known as the Dark Destroyer, he was a two-time world champion and in a glittering career he first put on his boxing gloves when he was serving for the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. <laughs> Nigel Benn went on to win 42 out of 48 of his professional fights. Fight by the of the neck. 35 of those victories were knockouts. Looking back over his life, it's easy to see that Nigel's longest fight, his greatest fight, and his finest victory was actually the battle he fought with himself. <laughs> Nigel Benn was eight years old when a family tragedy turned his world upside down. Something in my heart was severed. I had no feelings. That pattern from a young eight-year-old boy went all the way through my life, the anger and the hurt that I had. Five years in the army gave him discipline and a will to win. There were highs. Nigel was a marauding, attacking puncher who just walked you down, put you to the ropes and knocked you out. Nigel Benn, the Dark Destroyer. And there were also lows. I remember kissing my hand saying sorry, and that was it. Outside the boxing ring, Nigel's life spiralled out of control. He lived his life like he, like he used to fight. I didn't even care about the fight. Get him out of the way. Let's go out and party. Shocking. Eventually, his past caught up with him, and Nigel even thought about taking his own life. I don't know if I wanted to die. I think I just wanted to sort of say, you know what? You're going to be all right. Help came from an unexpected source. God used the 63-year-old woman to break Nigel down to who God created Nigel to be. What I want to know is how, against all the odds, Nigel Benn won the fight of his life. Is this bringing back memories? Although... Oh. Actually, this was your club, wasn't it? But not this building? Yeah, this is where, that actually where I really started boxing, with that West Ham. It's got so much character, it's got so much history as well. But it's you're on the changed. board over there, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Hang on a minute. 1986, just after Mark Kayla. I was going to say, it would have been nice if I had some lights, my name up in lights there, but I'll take that. Oh, well, I'll stick some fairy lights <laughs> up there for you for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Gregory Benn was born on the 22nd of January 1964 in Ilford, Essex, to parents Dixon and Mina, who came to England from Barbados in the mid-1950s with their growing family, all boys. So what was family like when you were growing up in a house full of seven boys? Your mum was the only woman. <laughs> mum was the only woman that she wanted a girl so badly. <laughs> from the top, Andy, Dermot. John, Danny, Mark, Nigel, and Tony. Nigel being the second from youngest, uh, obviously we looked after him, you know what I mean? But um, after a certain amount of years, he looked after himself, you know? That's the type of chap he was, you know? Yeah, we just had 50 cuffs amongst each other. But being honest with you, it was the best time of my life. We never had much. So I was going to the car and said, Mum, we ain't got no food. And she come out with a beige and accent. What do you mean you ain't got no food? And she would knock something up. Think, oh, wow, that was great. What so, sort of mum was she? Mum was good. Mum, mum was all right. <laughs> mum, oh, if I was naughty, you say you wait till I tell your dad. I'm like, no. What do you want me to clean up, mum? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? Wash it up or oh, whatever. But mum was good. So, mum but was your good. father was the disciplinarian. My dad was disciplined, but he was fair. But the minute you stepped out of line, he come down near heavy. I know my dad loved me very much. Out of all these seven boys, we were the closest. Were you? Absolutely. But in 1972, Nigel's parents were faced with devastating news, which they had to break to the rest of the family. Uh, whew, um, all I remember, it was about 
up at about four or five o'clock in the morning. And uh, I remember hearing my mum screaming, screaming, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. I was eight years old, I didn't understand what dead was. Mum and dad got us into the room, got us, woke us all up. I literally said, um, your brother won't be coming home again. And we said, what do you mean won't be coming home again? I said, he's dead, you know? And, uh, yeah, that was about it, really, you know? And that's what I remembered. I was only, um, 11, 12, and... Our biggest brother was our hero. He was, uh, he was, he looked after us, you know. And the house is like police cars are flashing outside the lights and all that. And then I found out my brother was killed by racists. By pushed, racists? Yeah, he's pushed through a window, cut his grind, and bled to death. Nigel believes his brother was murdered, but nothing was ever proved beyond the bare facts. And he fell from an upstairs window onto a glass roof. How old was he? He was 17. Back then, you think, well, when you're 18, you're like a, you're like a man. And now that I'm 52, nearly 53, I think he was just a little boy. Because he's the only one that came from Barbados. All my other brothers were all born in England. He was the only one. So it was really a, a, a um, really telling time for mum and dad. They, they seemed like they brought him all the way from Barbados, brought him to England. To die? And he died. So it was really hard for them. Yeah. And uh, it was hard for the family because no one talked about it for many, many years until we were all adults. No one ever talked about it. It was tough. It was a tough, tough, tough five, six years just getting over it, you know? Even now, it's still, you know, still getting emotional. Yeah. Losing the brother he worshipped had a lasting effect on the young, impressionable Nigel. Me and my brother Andy, we were, we were so close. You know, I just loved him. Something in my heart was severed. I just changed. I had no feelings. And you're going to show you that pattern from a young eight-year-old boy went all the way through my life, the anger and the hurt that I had. I started smoking at eight, and I was always fighting. He was time, smoking at eight. Yeah, eight years old. I just just went just went off. The, the main things with Nigel when he was a youngster was fighting, always in scraps. Even he wouldn't be afraid to get in a scrap and he got a bit of light thing good and go into places and take stuff and you know. I was always shoplifting. I remember 1976, <laughs> nicked a crushed velvet jacket from Marks and Spencer's. All worse than Marks and Spencer weren't like Versace or anything. Oh, I'd done a lot of bad things. Nicked my auntie's purse, my next door neighbor's purse. I just just went off the rails. Needed money. What did you need money for? Just that so I can go and just enjoy myself. And then I'd, I made everybody in school on my birthday bring me 50 pence. You cool. made everybody? Yeah. What, you bullied them into it? Yeah, I was a horrible kid, yeah. He was definitely a rogue, you know, but um, that was him, you know what I mean? Were you caught? Oh, yeah, I caught. I think, oh, please send my mum, not my dad. Oh, please, please send my mum. How did your father react? He said, by hook or by crook, you're not going to end up like your brother. I think, oh, OK, right. Not end up dead like Andy? yeah. yeah. And he and I was going that way. I was going that way, and he, I think what, what he was trying to do was try to steer me the other way. Mm. Was there much church in your life? No church at all. Yeah, not my cup of tea. So at that time, yeah. God wasn't present in your life. No, not at all. He was around me, but I didn't know him. Not at all. No, no. Far from it. I was more in the in the other corner. <laughs> by by far, more in the other corner. As Nigel reached 16, his parents were at the end of their tether. They turned to one of their older sons, John, for help with the tearaway teenager. My brother John was in the army. John oh, the was army. he? And John used to walk down our road in his uniform, he looking immaculate. It was like a fanfare. I was like, well, look, here comes John, it was like that. Everything about him 
just love to just go, want to be like John. John was serving overseas when he received a desperate phone call from his mum. I could tell in her voice that something weren't right, and uh, she said, John, she said, John, do me a big favour. She said, um, have a word with Nigel, get him in the army, because I can see him killing somebody or getting killed or being put in prison. Please have a word with him and get him in the army. And I said, Mum, don't worry, when I'm on leave next time, I'll have a chat with him. And so Nigel joined the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, 1st Battalion, and reported for his initial 18-week training. Now, the objective of your training is to transform you from the soft life of a civilian into a robust fighting man. <sighs> wow. Basic training, mate. It was like, I can't say what they used to say to you. Stand your attention when you're speaking to me! I mean, screaming in your ears. Sit down! Screaming, tipping you up in the bed. Wakey, wakey, rise and shine, let's be having you. Oh, Mum! <laughs> <laughs> How old were you then? I was 17. I would not change it for anything because I learned so much about myself. Because mm. at that time, Rocky was out. We would be running in the snow, the sleep would be bouncing off of the air. Yeah, I'm a he man, you know? You, you're just like, nothing could affect you because it just changed my mentality. If I didn't join the army, I don't know where I would be. For me, joining the army, um, yeah, it was the best move I ever done. It gave me that discipline, that determination, and will to win. Mm. So the anger you had from Andy's death and all of those troubled teenage years mm. was being exhausted, really, by this? No, it's just in the back. You just left him. It's back. just in the back at this present moment because I'm learning something. What was going on before back in Ilford is... I can't even think about that now. I have not got time to think about what was going on. The anger from what happened to my brother is still in me and it's going to carry me through a lot of the arenas that I'm going to go through now. During his time in the army, Nigel was sent on operational tour to Germany, where his brother John was also stationed. He was a boxer, wasn't he, in the yes. army? Yes. Is that what led you into boxing? No, it was already in me. I was always street fighting anyway. I without was, gloves? Yeah, without gloves, and, um, yeah, no, that was already in me, cos I did martial arts. I was always in... I was always into contact sports. Nigel took every opportunity the army offered to develop his boxing skills. This is not come dancing. You're allowed to hit. Bell! But it wasn't just a passion for fighting that kept him in the ring. If you're good at sport in the army, they take good care of you really take good care of you. Yeah, he boxed because he could get away with murder. We didn't wear a uniform, we didn't do any duties, and we, we were treated like kings, basically. And uh, I think that's the way. He, 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 he done it more for that than, than, than actually the love of, love of boxing, to be honest with you. Instead of me getting out of my bed at 4.45 in the morning, I'm getting out of my bed at 9 o'clock. While they're all having slops and all that, I'm having steak and salad. That was a good incentive, yeah, wasn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Whatever the motives behind his army boxing, he proved to be a formidable opponent. When did you know that you were really good at boxing? I didn't. Really? I didn't. How many wins had you had in the army? All. All of them? Yeah, lose the one. So how many fights was that? About 50. When his time in the army came to an end, Nigel returned to London. He continued to box, but he also had bills to pay. I come up with an exemplary record, so I had no problem getting a job. I still detected in Woolworth where I used to shoplift. <laughs> His ambitions in life were modest. I just wanted to tear it out like my dad, because I thought my dad had made it. And be one better than my dad, I love a BMW. That's all I wanted. I just wanted a terrace house like my dad. I didn't want nothing much, just like my dad. 
After store detective work, Nigel switched to armoured van security and discovered that even after four years of army discipline, temptation wasn't far away. So you were doing cash in transit yeah, in the vans? Yeah, we were cash in the Oh, yeah, and the thought that going through thick, I like 500,000 now. Oh, how can I get this out? Did you? Oh, you were tempted? Of course I was. Did you have a plan, though, in your head? Did you think... Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Wouldn't have worked, but <laughs> yeah, we were blowing the van up. Oh, the money would have just been left in. The top would have been open. You know, you had plans. <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> Nigel's plans now included another person in his life. Tell me about meeting Sharon, your first wife. Yeah, me and Sharon, um, yeah. <laughs> oh. And throw me there. <laughs> yeah, me and Shannon, yeah, we, we got really well. We got really well at the, in the beginning. Yeah. Well, you were very young, both yeah. of you, for a start. We were young, we were young. And I think, um, me and my wife, my first wife, we weren't, we weren't meant to be. No. We weren't meant to be. And that's no disrespect to her. We just didn't know how to love one another. We had three, three beautiful kids, Dominic, Sade, and Renee. Nigel was working full time to support his family, but he was also making a name for himself in boxing's amateur ranks. Nigel Benn comes from Mark Kaler's old club, but well, the man he has to beat is Gloucester's Johnny Melfar. After knocking out 24 of his 28 opponents, he beat Johnny Malfar in 1986 to become amateur boxing's middleweight champion. Another chance of looking at it here. Ben seems to me to be immensely strong. The following year, his life changed when he turned professional. Your first professional fight, you obviously you remember that. Graham Ahmed at um, Festival Hall in Croydon. Was that a good purse to start with? Oh, no, I only started off on like um, a thousand pound. But to me, and I can remember, I remember signing on at 16. I remember it today, if it was like yesterday, I was getting £36.40 every two weeks. Yes. I remember that. It's like God's always reminded me, yeah, remember where you come from, you're £36.40 every two weeks. Yes. Then all of a sudden, it was like getting a thousand pound. Wow, I get a thousand pound for knocking. And then it just went from like five, 15, 50, 100, 400 and so on. Wow. Money was just coming in. From every fight? Yeah. When I train, I run, I, I think, yeah, Mercedes Sports, nice big house, money in the bank, Rolex watches, diamonds, everything. That's what I think about. And that's what drives me on. That's what I want. And I'm willing to work hard for it. Been a year, didn't know we moved to a seven bedroom mansion. Wow. This is my house, a big massive swimming pool, massive garden. I'm like, I, I, I own this house. <laughs> this is mine, so. After turning pro in 1987, the fights and the victories just kept coming. One a month. Mm -hmm. And they were all wins. The 22 wins, 22 fights, 22 knockouts. In April 1988, less than a year after his first professional fight, Nigel won the Commonwealth middleweight title and a formidable nickname. Nigel Bent, the Dark Destroyer. Popular boxes in the country at the moment. And this is a moment really when your celebrity life's really kicked in. Excellent, yeah. From that time, once I got that belt around my waist, that was it. I have watched many of my dad's fights. He's he's like a warrior when he goes in there. Ferocious, savage, animal. When I hit somebody, I know I'm hitting them hard. And now if you get in the ring with him, there's just going to be no way out, really. 
And I think he's he was an amazing fighter. Just knock him out, boom, that's it. Right on the chin, and he's out. I think if I weren't related to Dad, and I just saw him back in his boxing days, I'd be terrified of him. <laughs> terrified. <laughs> Did you get the posse of people around you, the entourage? Listen, <laughs> wow. Yeah? They just come out from everywhere. And you know what it is? It was like, wherever I went, I had an entourage. How many? We'd have a posse of bullheads. You know what bullheads are? Massive bodybuilders all around us, but all like pals. All pals, and we just, we'd like take over a club for like, We've done this for about 10 years. It was just too excessive sometimes, you know? Everybody's throwing stuff, oh, come here, I want you here, I want you there, and it was, it was just too much. I didn't even care about the fight. Get him out of the way, let's go out and party. That was my whole attitude. Shocking. I just got swept along. I just got swept along. It was just unbelievable. It was Who like... Who was paying the bills, though? You? No, the, these people had money as well. These um, people? That sounds very underworldy. Yeah. Gangsterland. Yes. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah, very, very, very... These people that come along, as they say, your mates, they want to take you here, they want to give you this, want to give you that, they're not your friends. They're just after being... They want to be seen with you, they want you to do stuff for them and stuff. But, you know, I've always said, I had friends before I had money, and they're my same friends. That's my policy. So, and it was like, um, all through my career, I couldn't stop. It was like I was getting pulled around. It was all these film shows, and it's like, ugh, I just didn't really have no time to myself. It just merry go around. I, I couldn't get off. It was like that. Has all this fame and fortune changed the so-called Dark Destroyer? You bet it has. I'm going to stay in the fight. I'm going to make it right. I said... Nigel Ben. Incidentally, you may have noticed some uh, rapping music in the background during that film. It was, in fact, taken from Nigel's new pop single, Stand Up and Fight, which will be in the shops very shortly. With his single peaking in the charts at 61, Nigel was never going to be a pop star. In the ring, he continued to power his way to the top, a seemingly unstoppable force. But he was about to learn his first hard lesson as a professional boxer. Finsbury Park, London, 21st of May, 1989. Nigel Benn, the Dark Destroyer, against Michael Watson, the Force. They thought they could walk through Michael Watson. They thought Michael Watson was soft. What can he do to me? 22 fights, 22 wins, 22 KOs. What can he do to me? I remember, this is how confident I was. I went to the hairdressers to get my hair plaited, I think, a couple of hours before the flight. He was more concerned about his hair than he, he was about Michael Watson. He should have been more concerned about Michael Watson. Well, I'm, I'm in the greatest shape ever. I mean, if I stop then, it'd become, it'd become like a bonus. But I'm ready to have a really good time. Nigel started the normal way. Wow, wow, I'm just throwing everything at him. and. You could see things unfolding from about four rounds into the fight. After five rounds, I'm like on empty. Oh, I know the light's flashing. <laughs> you're on empty, you're on empty. I think I went back to my corner, and this is what my trainer said to me. Go out there and steam him. Oh, just go out there and steam him. What have you, I've been doing for the last five rounds. He blew a gasket, he ran out of steam and just, he just couldn't seem to penetrate Michael Watson's defence. And Michael just hit me with a jab and I went down. Well, it's happened. The man who's swept to popularity on the strength of his lethal punching has himself landed on the canvas. Nigel Benn was knocked out in the sixth round at Finchley Park last night by Michael Watson. And that was a hell of a turn up for the books and everybody was flabbergasted, to be honest. And I remember walking back to my, my changing room 
and it was quite like this. You could hear a pin drop. It was like, everyone said, look, yo, Nigel, I'm just gonna hang out with Michael. Uh, when you get the title back, give me a ring, all right? <laughs> it was like that, so you're left on your own. It was just me and my jock strap left in the change room. Really? Yeah, and it was like, cause I thought I was the best thing since sliced bread. Well, you would. I, I, and I got the world on my shoulders now. <laughs> I'm a loser, I can't, that was it. All the negative thoughts started coming back, taking over. But the Dark Destroyer was destroyed. Mm. Oof. I well, no, 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 it wasn't destroyed. It's just well, lost. Yeah, no, because I come back. All right. All right, because you're going to get this right, because I, I came back. If I was destroyed, that means I would have gone for good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, but you lost, unfortunately, yes. your title. Yes, it was um, my first defeat. That was the first time uh, Nigel had to come to terms with the fact, well, I am vulnerable, I am beatable, I am human. The Michael Watson fight was Nigel's wake-up call. Am I going to make it? Am I really as good as what I think I am? I had to go away. With his whole career at stake, Nigel headed across the Atlantic to the gym where Muhammad Ali himself had trained. Fifth Street Gym, Miami Beach, known as the University of Boxing. I went in better myself because I know there was more in me. I just needed to learn my trade and how to pace it because I never knew how to pace. I only had one gear, first gear. You did pretty well though. It was only one gear. Yeah. He did. But you know what? That was what was in me. That's what was in me. I want to know, can I do 10 rounds? Because I've never done 10 rounds before. Six rounds is like the really maximum with Michael Watson. And I was exhausted, I think, well, can I do 10 rounds? In Miami, Nigel went back to basics. He was honing his skills, training three times a day and sparring with top fighters. In Fifth Street Gym, oh, some guys used to bang, 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 knock my headgear flying, I think, oh. Really, Lord? I could just break my leg so I ain't got to come in sparring. That was my attitude. I hated sparring because I didn't understand him. But then after about three months, I understand their culture. And eventually, no one wanted to spar with me. So it was building your stamina. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I know how to go through the gears. Now I've got second, oh, I've got third, oh, right, it's got four, oh, I'll tell you what, this one's got fifth as well. <laughs> I never knew how to do that before. So Miami was the place. Absolutely. With renewed confidence, Nigel won his next five fights and in April 1990 beat Doug DeWitt to win his first world title. Congratulations and welcome to the WBO middleweight champ of the world, Nigel Benn. <laughs> He returned home and wasted no time in showing off his belt. That's the belt. That's the belt. Look at that belt. At what stage in the fight did you hurt your hand? I hurt it in the last punch in the eighth round. That, that was last, lucky. The very last punch. Yeah, that was lucky, wasn't it? If that had gone earlier, you might have been in trouble. No, I would have carried on using my right. Yeah. <laughs> Nigel didn't have long to bask in the glory of his world title. Someone else was after his belt. A fellow Brit who would become his greatest rival. When did you first hear the name Chris Eubank? I don't know, it was so funny. It was like... Where, 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 did, where did he come from? Eubank had done, you know, we had, had a couple of fights, but he really wasn't um, a big name. And suddenly he came in and with all this arrogance and brashness and said, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to, I'm going to wipe the floor with you. Christopher Livingston Eubank had also trained in the States. He'd never lost a fight. But it was his flamboyant persona outside the ring that was really getting him noticed. Who's this man with... <laughs> J joppers, a monocle and a cane, and with a list worst in mind. I don't know where you come. He's a sharp dresser. 
I thought, where did, I, I don't know where he come from. He just like was there. He was just like, we well, was just so different. And it was like, you know, he was just looking down at, on at everyone, looking just, he just thought he was better than everybody. He was just, <laughs> it was just, uh, just the way he was. So he, he genuinely got under your skin? Oh, big time. And I don't want to jump on him and fight him, for real. There was no, no, no playing around with me and him. There was no playing around with me and him. Nigel hated the man, passionately. Well, let's make sure the fight takes place by signing the contract right now. Christopher? I have to say, there seems an yes. element of genuine hate between these two, Ambrose. For sure. I have nothing to say to Nigel. I find the man uh, intolerable in that he's so wild. I have no time for such people. He has no class as far as I see it. It was fantastic. It was just great. And, you know, you don't get those type of rivalries. And it was just great to watch. I personally do hate him. So is there yeah, any point what... in me asking you to shake hands after signing no, no, the contract? No, 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 no. Chris Eubank with his molecule and his, his, his walking stick and Nigel just wanting to tear everyone limb from limb, you know. So, you know, you need them rivalries in boxing. That's what makes the sport. 18th of November, 1990, the NEC Birmingham. Eubank, the unbeaten fighter. Ben, with a reputation for knocking people out. Most of the boxing experts and the pundits all had, uh, uh, you know, Ben winning the fight easily, stopping Eubank, etc., etc., and this young pretender. Eubank was a very good fighter, but he didn't have that awe around him like Nigel had. That was a very tough fight. Very tough fight. It I mean, really it, was. It's just so strong. When Nigel went on the attack, you know, you could see the people sat in the stand next to you just sort of like move a little bit before more forward in the seat and, you know, you know, come on, Nigel. And he had a, a neck that was just full of muscle and he had a head that shaped like a mallet. It was just so strong. I was hitting him, like, ching! <laughs> I couldn't even dent it. I couldn't even dent it. Nigel was too aggressive, too eager going for the knockout. He flew at him with no care for the punches that were coming back of him. He can off bang. Mm. He's got a lot of power. And Eubank showed that night how tough he was. More than anything else, he had the ability to absorb punishment like nobody I've ever seen before. He just soaked it up. Even the referee said it was the most dramatic fight he'd ever refereed. Mm. We were throwing big bombs. We both wanted to be winners. Seconds from the end of round nine, Eubank took the fight and Nigel's belt. I didn't have a game plan. He had a game plan and what he'd done worked and I've got to take my hat off to him for that, which is very hard, but I will. The fight went down as a classic, but for Nigel, it was a devastating loss. It wasn't even about losing. It was that pride thing. It was that pride thing. Got because, personal. Yeah, it got very personal. It was like, <laughs> I told you this man was beneath me. You know how he talks. That's that how he is. That's how he is. So it was very personal. You back that one. That that one really rankled him. He still had to beat him. He had that fire in his belly. He had to beat him. It was another three years before the Ben Eubank rematch. It was one of the most anticipated and biggest British boxing events ever staged. He's beaten me and I won't even the score. You know, he prepared like the champion, you know, and I didn't. And I paid the price, badly. We now step aside to let the main event begin. Enjoy the fight. Good night. <laughs> I remember I saved up, I think I paid £70 for my ticket. It really did stoke up the nation. Mm -hmm. Everybody seemed to have Absolutely. watched it. Yeah. Half a billion people worldwide. Yeah. £70, you mean I was only about 15 or something like that? We made it, we made a million each. That's did you? Yes. In that one fight? Yeah, in that one fight. One fight, yeah. £70, I thought I'm going to have a belting seat here, I'm going to see every punch, and I wasn't, I was at the back and needed binoculars. They were just like two little, you know, one-pence pieces in, in the ring. But just the atmosphere. You know, Nigel went in there, you know, he was so aggressive and he put his heart on his sleeve and he, he, he went for the knockout. I think most people thought that Nigel did the did the better work by maybe just maybe a round or two. Oh, now it's really lining up now. They had to do that. Everyone thought I won, 
but I got a point deducted because they said they hit him low. Oh, yes, another low punch there. I think he might take a point away there. But if you see him, he actually wears his shorts up to here. <laughs> it's not on his belly button. After a thrilling final round, the bout was declared a draw. It wasn't a bad decision, you know, because it was that it was that close. This fight was a very close fight, and I had it a draw. I still won it anyway, but it went down as a draw, so I take it as a draw. Nigel was now a national celebrity. You repeat that, please. <laughs> Outside the ring, he was about to meet his match. Hi, my name's Caroline, and I met Nigel in a nightclub. Although I didn't know who he was, I thought he was a real knockout. <laughs> I saw him across, like, the dance floor, if you like, and I noticed his eyes. So I thought, wow, he's got very nice eyes. And when I saw it, I actually gave her a rose. Oh. I gave her a rose. So it was quite romantic, but I lost the rose. <laughs> <laughs> um, Caroline was like me, we, we just loved the, the rave music at the time. We just like clubbing both of us. And um, we, we talked for hours and then we'd, um, we were on the phone all the time. She didn't know who I was. I think um, looking back, that possibly um, interested him because I was not in his face. I was not all over Nigel. I'm trying to be like, I'm trying to kiss him on that. No, 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 what are you doing? Because I've always had that with other women. I was very forward of it. No, no, you none of that. I definitely was not interested in Nigel Ben, the celebrity, if you like. I mean, I don't even know if he really was a celebrity when I met him. So I still... You know, I, we just got on. We just laughed and laughed, and we were more friends, which was more important than anything else. When she found out who I was, she kept me quiet for two years. She kept me quiet for two years. So nobody knew she was seeing no you? No one knew she was seeing me, because my name was Rob. Oh, no, that is so embarrassing. <laughs> oh. My name was Rob. Ah, she said, oh, I'm seeing Rob, Rob tonight. It all sounds silly now. I was 20. So I didn't want my friends to um, think I'd changed because I was dating Nigel. Um, so I just gave him her name, Rob. Two years. Caroline hid her relationship with Nigel, but she made no secret of her feelings about his job in the ring. I couldn't bear to watch Nigel fight, but I would go to the fights and I'd sit front row or wherever they'd sit me, but I, I didn't actually ever watch the fight. I'd be looking down or um, have something in my hand the whole time. I'd go in case anything ever happened. And something did happen. On the 25th of February, 1995, Caroline had a ringside seat for Nigel's fight against the American Gerald McClellan, known as the G-Man. And McClellan was the bookmaker's favorite. At that time, McClellan was just knocking people out left, right and center. I've been watching him for five years, and I thought, so this guy is gonna be like one of the, one of the superstars. He's a tough guy. Yeah. Gerald McClellan, the mini Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. And everyone had me to be knocked out within round one to round three from the sun the mirror today the telegraph the observer every single one of them i was annoyed yeah i always knew nigel had a chance but i couldn't see him beating the guy even brother john was nervous about nigel getting hurt i might be on my straight with you i remember uh about a week before the fight I went to Nigel, I said, Nigel, do yourself a favour, Nigel, give your belt up. Nigel turned around to me, give me such a... He went, he went you know something, John? Not a hope in hell. I looked at him, I thought, well, I didn't have no fear at all. Absolutely no fear whatsoever. The day of that fight, the whole day I had a headache, I was just stressed out, absolutely stressed out. The atmosphere was evil, and the people were, were just wanting to see blood. He hit me, 
And then it hit me again, but I felt all the ligaments in my neck just stretch, and I went out. He knocked me out the ring, out, out on the canvas. Boom, boom, bang. Nigel's gone. He's gone, his face is cut, his face is, his cheeks cut. And he's knocked him straight through the rope. Absolutely gone. He did, he followed onto the table where all the commentators were, so we pushed him back in again. I mean, he just bashed the granny out of me the first round. But this is what happened. Now, something in my subconscious, I don't know what's gone on. Because after that, you watch the second round, I'm chasing him around. He just gave me a good hiding in the first round, but now I'm chasing him around. He rose from the ashes, and what a performance. It's something inside me that I didn't even know existed. The amount of bravery and the guts that he showed was remarkable. I could hear the, the power and the punches. It was unbelievable. One of the best performances by a British fighter of all time. The fight ended in round 10, when McClellan dropped to one knee. What happened next turned what should have been a famous victory into tragedy. McClellan collapsed in the ring after being stopped in the 10th round. Moments later, a large team of doctors and paramedics jumped in and struggled for 15 minutes in the ring to resuscitate him. He was taken to hospital for an operation to remove a blood clot from his brain. It's too early yet to say whether there's going to be any long-term uh, disability or, or any sign of damage as a result of this bleeding. Uh, it is in fact too early to say yet whether he's going to survive this blood clot or not. You went to see him in hospital? Yeah. I remember kissing my hand saying sorry and that was it. McClellan was in a coma for 11 days. He survived but suffered extensive and permanent brain damage. I came out with a damaged nose, damaged jaw, then a shadow on my brain. He came out paralysed, blind, 80% deaf and in a wheelchair. Mm. That's that's a terrible outcome, isn't it? Was it was a very terrible outcome. And that's yeah. not what you box for? No, it's not what we box for, but it was just, it, it, it happens. The fight was horrible and the outcome was just heartbreaking. No, you know, you don't ever think that something like that is ever going to happen. I've been in a, a, a tragic fight. Um, one of my opponents died in 1983. And you are changed inexorably. You can never be the same again. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't throw punches. It doesn't mean that you can't knock somebody out and hurt them. But it leaves an indelible mark on you. Something in the back of your mind always makes you hesitate. Just a moment's hesitation, and that's all it takes to get knocked out yourself. You're never quite the same again. It just, you just aren't. Nigel fought five times more before announcing his retirement in 1996. He looked to a new future with Caroline to match his glittering boxing career of 12 years. But there was to be no fairy tale ending. See, Caroline, she's the one for you. Absolutely. She stood by me through thick and thin. She stood firm. She knew I had a lot of issues as well. Mm. She knew I had a lot of issues, and you know what? She was willing to work through them. Got to understand, there were so many affairs in that. Your affairs? Yeah. Whatever did you do that for? Because sometimes a, a, a man's looking for love. Mm. And I didn't care where I got the love from. Mm. It was a, an addiction. Mm. <sighs> You're right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just filling some kind of void in you? No, I don't think the void is not what I've gone through, it's what I've done. Because I couldn't do things right. I was struggling. I was hurting a woman I loved it, and I didn't know how to break that. I was battling a lot of issues in my life. People think that I'm strong. I'm very weak. When yet another story came out in the newspapers about an affair, Caroline confronted Nigel. You and Caroline had had a terrible row at yeah. home. Yeah. That, yeah, we, we had a terrible row. 
And um, and I and I remember driving off in a black Grand Cherokee at a hose pipe. She tried to stop me, and I was just crying. Tortured by guilt, Nigel drove to a quiet corner of Streatham Common. And I'm there, and I was crying. I don't know if I wanted to die. I think I just wanted someone to say, you know what, you're going to be all right. And I remember driving home, and that was the lowest point of my life. Caroline was also struggling and feeling increasingly unable to cope. I'd um, dropped my children off to school and there was a group of mums outside and I don't think they were gossiping, I just don't think they knew what to say to me. And I walked the kids into school and I came out and for the first time, oddly, I'd noticed a big Church of England church opposite the school and I sat at the back of this empty church for about three hours and I just cried. They weren't tears of feeling sorry for myself, because I'd passed that. They were tears of, I need help, and I can't do this. And she went in there, she said, if you're real up there, you want to help me down there? And if you do, I'll worship you for the rest of my life. And I honestly heard, not an audible voice, but I heard God say to me, now you've come to me, I will help you. And that, and I tell you, I felt like the, and we hear it, but I'd never heard this before. I felt like the biggest rucksack had been taken off my back. I drove home to Nigel and we hadn't spoke for weeks. The whole atmosphere in the house was horrible for weeks. Um, I'm knocking on our door, didn't even open it with the key, just banging on our door and he opens the door and I said, Jesus said it's gonna be all right. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, uh, all right, yeah, okay. And he looked at me like I was mad. And he actually looked at me with such fear of what have I done to her. I felt like, man, I've really ruined this girl because I didn't know who Jesus was. N didn't know who Jesus was because I was always in the other corner. <laughs> I always get emotional when I speak about it because it's real. And then she'd go to church and I'd go to church with her and she'd lift up holy hands and praise God. I'd be like, oh, Oh, that's what, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, just doing what she's doing. I, I thought, she's a Christian, I must be a Christian, but it doesn't work like that. I think in the beginning, Nigel um, wanted to make the marriage work, so he just plodded along. So he just came to church. Um, I'd read my Bible to him. I didn't understand what I was reading, but I'd keep reading, and it obviously wasn't real to him then, at that moment. I was just following my wife but didn't understand what it really meant. In 2000, Nigel and Caroline moved with the family to Mallorca. They became friends with Cheryl, pastor of a church called The Vineyard. To all intents and purposes, their relationship seemed to be uh, good, apparently. And they seemed to be people who knew and loved the Lord. But I have to be totally honest, um, I really did feel at that time that things were probably not as right as they should be. Nigel was taking Bible classes with Cheryl for two years before, one day, he came out with a startling confession. I said, I've been having an affair. I didn't even want to say it, but it came out. It came out. He said, have you told your wife? I said, no. I said, well, you better go home and tell your wife. Nigel was all over the place. Uh, I mean, you know, he wanted to be forgiven, but he understood that this was not something that could now just be forgiven just like that. There needed to be a working through in all this. So all my life now, I'm at a crunch point. Caroline had been through this all too many times before, and now this man had betrayed her again. She was lovely, Pastor Cheryl. Um, she became my confidence, someone I'd really talked to about everything that was going on, because I didn't have that. I didn't trust anybody. We prayed, we talked things through, and in the end, 
I had the idea, well, how would you feel, Caroline, if uh, he came to stay with us and perhaps we could work this through? She needed space to be able to um, think things through. And I always remember Caroline's answer, just get rid of him, just get rid of him. So Nigel agreed to leave the family home and live for a year in Cheryl's house. We had to get back to basics of who the real Nigel Ben was. Because Nigel Ben had become the celebrity that had been promoted by the media. And that isn't who God created him to be. Nigel was put under a strict regime. Whatever we did, Nigel did with us because Nigel was always, before that, going where he wanted to go, doing what he wanted to do, and never being responsible or accountable to anybody. He stripped me of everything. His way of life, his house, his swimming pool, um, all those things, his family. I couldn't drive my Porsche on my Escalade. He had to drive our cars, which were nowhere near like that. A 25, 30-year-old G-Reg Escort wind-down windows. And the only thing I was allowed to watch in the house was Little House on the Prairie. Which he became addicted to, I might add. That was what I've actually got from season one right down to season ten. I've got them all. During that year, it was very tricky at times. Um, I'm very volatile, and um, Nigel is also very volatile. And... Um, and there were times when we were in disagreement. And it was like, how dare you? And I'd cry. I'd really cry. How dare you, Nigel? How dare you? Not too long ago, I was knocking people out for a living. And yet, I'm pet I was really, I don't know what happened for the whole year. I was just petrified. I was really scared. She's scared, yeah. And how amazing. Do you know, honestly, if God would have used a man, any man, Nigel would not have come under that authority or respect. So God used a 63-year-old woman to break Nigel down to who God created Nigel to be. It was like God took me back to school, but a whole, my whole life started changing. Now what I've done, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. He's my role model, as it says in uh, uh, James 1, 2, 6. If we say we abide in him, we ought to walk in the same manner as him. He's my role model, so I've got to walk like him. During that year, Nigel finally began to come to terms with the events that had changed his life, aged eight, the death of his brother. His brother's death was very, very profound in his life. And he needed to get rid of all that that had happened to him as a child. And then, again, as a celebrity. So yes, he did. He needed to talk those things out. So everything about the issues with my brother was what I was really battling with. Wow, OK. And I was really angry for my brother. In James 1.20, twenty talks about be quick to listen and slow to speak, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Wow, so I think, okay, we're all oh, got, got to lose that anger. Then you go to Matthew 5, it says, if someone slaps you in the cheek, give him the other side also. I'm working on that one. <laughs> I'm working. We're getting there. Nigel and Caroline left Mallorca in 2012 and have now settled in Australia. Nigel's wild past is behind him. As for boxing, he's now mentor to his son, Connor, who followed his father into the ring. He gives me advice on boxing, but he's more concerned about the party and the drinking, the drugs, the girls. You know, our dad just says, stay away from it, son. You know, I didn't benefit him in any way. His main thing that he always says is, like, I've been there, done that, I don't want you to go down that path. So it's like, OK, Dad. Well, the Nigel I, I, I first knew was a rogue, uh, womanizer, drinker. Now he's gone completely the other way. I never seen a man change so much. He is a better person, ten times better person. He worked so hard. He really worked so hard to give us the best life. You know, what a better man to, to have in my corner and tell me about my day-to-day -day life. You know, it's a blessing. He's just amazing. 
Yes, he's my best friend. Your heart is clean, your faith is clearly pouring out of yeah. you. What's next? Well, what next now, me and my wife, we go to, we do volunteer work at Hillsong Church in Australia. Here now, Hillsong Church is colossal. Hillsong is a global church belonging to the Pentecostal tradition. As you stand in your presence. It's known for its worship music and the community work for which Nigel and Caroline volunteer. As I look to the heavens. And you know what it is? I have more enjoyment doing that than any world titles. I feel blessed, I feel honoured and privileged that God would use me to go and serve. And it's all about serving. And me and my wife, we love it. We come over and say, wow, that was a good day. Thank you, Jesus. So that's how blessed we feel. I'm doing that because the other work was all about drugs, sex and rock and roll and everything, partying and all that. I'm glad I went through that to, to get where I am now. And that's how I am now. And what will you be doing for Christmas? What I'm doing, I just be spending time giving thanks and praise for what he's done in our life. He said, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And so I stand close to him. Once I'm close to him, I can't go wrong. Nigel, I'm going to give you a little Christmas present before you go. Thank you so much. You've given us a wonderful, wonderful conversation. This is for you. You're allowed to open it now. Have a look at it. It's sentimental. Oh, yeah. Shake it up. And what does it say on it? It says, peace. Yes. That surpasses all understanding. Yes. His peace. Thank you very much. Oh, bless you. Mm. Mm. Happy Christmas thank you. to you and all your family. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's brilliant. <laughs> Have that in the Australian sunshine. Yeah, That'd be that's beautiful. It. <laughs> I think this time of year is a very easy time to be aware of the dark things in your life and the dark sides of your life and the things that are wrong with your life as Christmas approaches. I don't know why that should be, but it does. So if you're someone who's facing problems going into Christmas and perhaps into the new year, hang on to what Nigel was talking about because he has been to the depths. And look how happy and free and peaceful he is now. And if you have a faith in God, as Nigel has, then maybe God is in your corner.